Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Fundamentals of Financial Management. Um, once again, I'm Dr. Brad Beauvais, and I want to spend the next few minutes uh, kind of walking and talking through some of the fundamental aspects of not only this course, uh, but also the field of financial management. Why are we here? What are we doing? What sort of uh, concepts and, and material are we really expecting to see during the course of the of the semester? Um, but also start to um, impart some of the fundamental tools that really we're going to draw from um, for the duration um, of our time together and truthfully well into your professional careers. So first question really we need to address is what is this thing called finance? And you know, without reading directly off the slide, really finance is a decision science um, and really centered on how we acquire um, and actually put uh, into, uh, into practical effect the funds that uh, come through any organization, whether that's a, a not-for-profit um, hospital, um, a for-profit uh, technology company, um, whatever the case may be. And of course, the same concept extends um, into our personal finance realm, especially as we start talking about investments of any kind, whether that's real estate, a stock, a bond, what have you, um, as well as into public finance. And we can certainly look at um, you know, the, the, a recent newspaper, the news, whatever. Uh, we hear discussions over uh, tax revenues and the deficit and you know, basically all of the, the issues that we hear batted around with, as part of the budgetary discussions up on Capitol Hill. But our primary focus for the purposes of this class is this middle element of corporate finance um, and really how organizations, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just a, a for-profit company, but how organizations both acquire and manage the funds um, that, are, uh, that flow through um, the organization. So during the course of this semester, um, we're going to talk about some pretty fundamental concepts within the field of financial management. Um, we're going to start today with uh, the time value of money, why that's important and how that's used. We're going to walk and talk through risk evaluation and analysis, debt and equity financing, the concept of the weighted average cost of capital and how that is actually employed and used in the capital budgeting process. We will then look at capital budgeting through a risk analysis lens um, as different uh, projects, different investments, what have you, um, you know, come into uh, into play or into consideration. Um, we'll also talk through lease versus buy analysis and kind of wrap up our semester um, through working capital and current asset management. So we're going to start um, at the very basic level, very fundamental level, with the concept of the time value money. And I kind of put in parentheses here, this is really content that you should have learned in high school. Um, I think a, a vast um, segment of our society would, would benefit greatly from understanding how the time value of money works. Because really this is the foundational element um, that really forms the basis of how we calculate a car payment, a mortgage payment, um, how we really look at the, the issues of, of compounding you know, as we start to contribute towards a 401k or any sort of savings account, whether that's for college or for retirement. Um, and we'll find also this is how organizations um, really start to understand how to um, discount from a future value and understand what a series of cash flows um, given at some period of time or earned at some um, future period of time are worth to us today. So first and foremost, um, we have to understand, uh, we have to go through this time value of money um, basically calculation process because as we start to look at any sort of series of cash flows, we have to understand that dollars in some out year, whether that's a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, are worth a different amount um, than they are today. And primarily this is driven by inflation. Uh, we could also talk about aspects of risk as well. But um, basically a dollar in hand today is worth more than a dollar received at some point in the future. And that's really, again, that's an inflationary sort of issue. Um, because of that, we have to adjust any future um, cash flows to uh, appropriately in order to value all those future cash flows on a present value basis. And there's a good little Investopedia link there that, that's in your slide deck that uh, will explain this in some further detail. I encourage you to, to click through. So how do we start this? Well, um, as basic as it sounds, um, we start um, with a timeline. And you know you can draw it however you want. You can draw it wherever you want. 
Um, it could be on the back of a napkin, it could be on a, a cereal box, um, in Excel, um, whatever. But really what we have to start to understand is when and how cash flows accru accrue as part of any sort of project or investment um, valuation process. And again, as it says on the screen there, um, a linear representation of potential cash flows. Um, and really what it does for us is helps to crystallize exactly when a cash flow is going to occur. Um, and we can get ourselves into some pretty um, you know, muddy water if we don't understand when we have to pay certain things, when we can expect payment for certain things, and then appropriately analyze based on time value money concepts. So here's the basic timeline. Um, the cash flow or the CF0 um, is considered to be today. Again, CF0 is considered to be today or whenever we expect the project or the investment um, to start. Um, and then any future period, one, two, three, could be a month from now, um, a year from now, or you know, whatever um, time, um, you know, basically time frame you want to consider. Okay? So the key is, and I'll explain this a little bit later, but the key is, is to make sure that that time frame is consistently applied across our timeline. So we can't compare weeks with months, months with years, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, so time one, end of period one, of course any inflow um, is considered a positive cash flow and any outflows are marked with that negative or minus sign, okay? I can tell you from personal experience, um, it's embarrassing when you get up in front of a, an executive level audience and you suddenly realize that something that should be going in um, as a negative has been put in as a positive and that completely disrupts um, your entire analysis. So um, one of the things we'll talk about throughout this class is being very, very particular, very, very careful with how um, cash flows are entered into any sort of um, finance analysis. Okay, Simply missing that one minus sign can throw your analysis off by hundreds, thousands, millions of dollars potentially. Um, missing a comma, missing, missing a, you know, the currency valuation, whether that's in dollars, yen, whatever, um, also very important. And many of you will work in environments where you know, the dollar values are large and the denomination of currency um, can vary somewhat. So um, just word to the wise throughout this course and beyond, um, just be careful about how things are entered. So there's three rules to time travel. Um, didn't realize that this was quantum physics. I know many of you thought maybe you're, uh, you're, you're signing up for a finance class, but we're actually going to talk about time travel, um, of course, within the financial realm. So first and foremost, I'm kind of reiterating rule number one to time travel. Only values at the same point in time can be compared or combined. That means that I can only compare years with years, weeks with weeks, months with months. Okay, We can appropriately adjust the, the math in order to make that um, comparable, but we have to make sure that we're on the same sort of, of, of time frame. Again, typically we're going to look at years, but um, due to various characteristics of the project you're considering, you may want to change it to months, may want to change it to weeks or even days. Second rule, um, anytime you move forward in time, it's called compounding. That should be a familiar term with many. Um, and then you can see the actual mathematical calculation um, of what we do over there to the right with the future value at any time period n, whether that's three years from now, let's say, the future value in three years is our initial capital, C, times one plus R to the nth. So R in this case is our interest rate and N is the number of periods in our example would be three. The third rule is moving backward in time, you discount it. And I would argue we use this particular rule um, probably in finance, at least in my professional experience, more often than anything else. Um, this is just the inverse of our compounding calculation. Here we just put that, uh, that capital or that cash flow we're expecting to receive at three, four, or five years in the future. That's in our numerator. In the denominator, we then have our one plus r to the nth that I just explained under rule number two. So that first rule, again, we can only combine or, uh, or compare values at the same point in time. So an example of this, if I prefer a gift of $1,000 today or $1,210 at a future, or rather, which would I prefer? Um, 
you know, and without uh, belaboring the point, it really kind of depends, right? Well, it depends on when we talk about in the future. Is that tomorrow? Um, or is that, uh, you know, uh, a year from now, five years from now, what have you. And another big factor that we're going to talk about frequently in this course is risk. What is the risk factor involved um, with any particular uh, likelihood of a cash flow accruing in our benefit um, or a, a debit um, of some kind? Second rule of time travel from a purely um, mathematical standpoint, um, we're looking at, uh, for example, if we look back at that $1,000 um, that we were going to receive in, the, in the, the first rule, and we now compound it, right? by 10% over a two-year period, we can see that $1,000 today is roughly equivalent to $1,210 um, two years from now at 10%. So one could argue that we're essentially um, you know, ambivalent in terms of which one we receive if we set aside the issue of risk. How likely is it that we're going to get paid um, two years from now $1,210? Okay? So again, that's a topic we'll revisit um, you know, in the future. So that second rule of time travel, again, we can do it long-handed mathematically however many times we need to. So if this is over a 20-year period, you can understand that this, you know, at least from a long-hand perspective, would be somewhat laborious. Okay, And I'll skip over this. You can read through the example um, in the slides. Um, hopefully understand uh, in a little greater detail uh, what that looks like uh, from a purely calculative standpoint. Third rule of time travel again is discounting. Um, this is where we find our present value of a future cash flow. Um, again, um, as an example, offer an investment uh, that pays $10,000 in five years. I expect, expect to earn a 10% return. What's that worth to me today? Well, we can do the simple math and come up with that particular figure of $6,209. <clears throat> so recapping all three of these rules, um, again, rule number one, can only compare and combine um, time values at the same point in time. Um, as we move forward in time, it's called compounding. As we move backward in time, it's called discounting. Okay, now... Because we're talking about um, finance in particular with an you know, organizational setting, you can understand that our cash flows are going to be widely variable, positive and negative over a series of time. So we need to be able to understand how to value um, a stream of cash flows and come to a, a, an appropriate valuation outcome. So of course we can do this mathematically. Um, and we can go through the, the, the basically the discounting process and find that PV, that present value, which is simply the summation of all of the present values from basically from start to finish or from zero to N in this case, using our summation um, you know, calculation. Um, and again, discounting each one of those appropriately by the, the right number or, or the exponent, in this case of the N, um, at the appropriate discount rate or the R, um, and come up with a summation of all of those values. Um, of course, that can be done um, mathematically. But what I'm going to show you here very shortly is how we do this and how we basically um, leverage Excel to do a lot of this heavy lifting um, for us um, without having to go through some the great hoops that you can understand um, doing or what the longhand version of this would, would really entail. So here's an example. Again, I'm not going to belabor this point. You can see how mathematically this would, would actually play out and how we would have to go through the process. But again, I'm here to make things, um, and as I stressed, um, you know, in my introductory um, section for the class, you know, as we talk about things from a you know a purely um, functional standpoint, this class really is going to focus on the practical. How do we actually do this, um, you know, on the job? How can we leverage Microsoft Excel and, and other tools to help us reach a better organizational decision? So. Of course, we can use a regular calculator um, to, to go through the mathematical process that I just showed you. We can also use a financial calculator. That's actually how I learned um, finance when I was going through school. But of course, most practitioners, uh, most professionals um, across industries use Excel or some version of a spreadsheet program in order to um, help um, do the, a lot of the heavy lifting uh, with you know, the calculations that we have to perform. 
And even though you can do um, the longhand calculations in the, at the entry or the early parts of this course, I highly, highly recommend um, that you become familiar with Excel um, using some of the tools and models that I've, I'm supplying to you within the course room um, on Canvas um, to really help um, learn and help you to, to develop um, these problems and, and solutions. Um, because as we get into things like capital budgeting, things like risk analysis, things like lease financing, um, the longhand calculations are incredibly laborious um, and incredibly difficult, um, whereas Excel allows us to be much more flexible and much more, um, you know, frankly capable of understanding, you know, what a, a particular project or investment is actually going to do over a period of time. So <clears throat> if just going back to some of the, the basics here, what if the future value or what is the future value of $100 due in three years if the interest rate's 10%? Um, and note that in some text or readings, you'll see R and I substituted for the interest rate. They mean the same thing. So don't be confused as, you, as we're kind of walking and talking through the slides because I'm frankly, I'm leveraging content from a couple different sources. So I want to make sure that that doesn't confuse anybody. So in this case, <clears throat> we can do the regular calculator solution. We're taking that $100 and of course, uh, we're compounding it over a, a, a three year period. We can do that with the regular calculator, come up to our $133.10. But the easy way is we can go into Excel and go type in, in any cell, equal FV and open a parentheses right here type in our rate, in this case it's 10%, and you can enter in a 0.1, or you could actually enter this as a 10% with the percent sign, comma, three years, or the number of periods, that's n per is three. We're skipping over payment at this point, that'll become important when we start talking about bond valuation and annuities, but that payment skipped over, so we just leave that blank, and then we have a present value of 100 bucks, that's our initial investment, okay? And then we're not going to use type. Type is going to become important when we start looking at annuities due versus a normal or, or regular annuity. But in this case, we're not using payment and we're not using type. So we close the parentheses and we come up with that same $133.10. Now, as my arrow here indicates, normally if I'm taking $100 out of my pocket to invest, I want to enter this as a negative 100 that will return a positive $133.10 when I actually come to my calculation, okay? One or the other is going to be negative, okay? That's just the way the formula works. Um, and if we're doing this completely appropriately, we want to put a negative in here to get that positive 133.10. Okay, here are the terms that I just described just for a little bit more detail. And you can see how, again, as we put things in for the payment later on, as we put things in for the type, uh, what that really means. Uh, but we'll, we, re, we will revisit um, that content uh, in a little while. So what's the present value of $100 due in three years um, if the interest rate's 10%? And again, this is discounting. So that $130 or $100 in three years, what's it worth to me today at 10%? Okay, again, I can do this mathematically, of course, as we've learned before, um, but I can also, of course, do it in Excel. Here's my equal. In this case, it's present value, or PV. Open up my parentheses, that same 10% rate, that same number of periods of three. Again, I skip over the payment. $100 is my future value. Type, again, is skipped over. Close my parentheses, and I get $75.13. Okay. So other cool things we can do in Excel with regards to time value money is we can start to understand, well, what is the rate I'm earning on any given investment? So here we have an example of an account that will pay $200 after five years on each $75 invested. So I deposit 75 bucks in the bank. I get $200, um, you know, after a five year period. Well, what's the implied rate to that. Um, ends up being a pretty good deal, 22% rate, but it's just simply the equal rate, open parentheses, five years. Okay, I'm not entering a, a payment or not receiving any subsequent payments or making any subsequent payments rather. 
<clears throat> my present value is negative 75. That's the, those are the dollars I actually put in the bank. My future value is 200. Again, I skip over type, close my parentheses, and I end up with 22%. I can also solve for the time period involved, or the number of periods. Um, your textbook, I believe, talks about the rule of 72. That mean, that's kind of a thumbnail guesstimate of about how long it will take for an investment to double at a given interest rate. So if we do the rule of 72, 72 divided by 20%, you end up with 3.6 years. Again, kind of a thumbnail guess. Well, the, the N per calculation can get much more specific, exactly the number or the amount of time it will take for that investment to double. So equal N per, open my parentheses, here's my rate, 20%. Again, no payment, so it's zero. Present value is $1, negative. How long does it take to turn into $2? Okay, that's two, that's my future value. Again, don't use type, close the parentheses, and we end up with a very specific 3.801784, okay? Now, I, I drew this out for a purpose. Um, when we're talking about doing financial calculations, um, if you have to lift in place any sort of calculation, my recommendation is you take it out to four decimal places, okay? My, the better option to this is when we start building calculations and start doing things in Excel, is we link cells together. And I'll show you how to do that if you don't know how to do that in Excel. Because this actual, you know, if you think about pi, for example, 3.14. Well, 3.14 is where we typically cut it off. As most of us know, pi extends um, into infinity. Um, so um, if we leave pi or any sort of calculation like pi in Excel, Excel will use the entire number, okay? Which means that our financial calculations end up being very, very precise or much more precise than if we decide that we're gonna cut it off. If we have to lift in place, we take things to four decimal points. And in most cases, although not all, within the homeworks in this particular course, um, in a practical setting, if you take it out to, to four decimal uh, places, generally that's enough granularity, enough clarity for uh, most individuals to understand exactly um, you know, how much or how what the valuation is of, of any particular calculation. So just word to the wise. Okay, so like I said before, um, annuities are one of the applications where we can actually use time value money calculations. So a three-year ordinary annuity um, versus a three-year annuity due. Um, and most people associate annuities with, uh, with retirement. Um, for example, myself, I retired in August of 2015 uh, from the United States Army. Um, by the good grace of uh, the American taxpayer um, and 20 years of service, I received my first retirement payment um, basically a month later. Okay, so I retired in August. My first payment comes in September, October, November, and so on. Okay, that's an ordinary annuity. And you see that often in um, you know, structured settlements. Um, you see that uh, you know, with, with various different um, um, you know, basically you know, payment structures and, and normal you know, investment annuities and, and you know, so on and so forth. Okay? Now, a classic example of an annuity due is when I don't have to wait for that first payment. Okay? So a class, classic example is the lottery payment. I'm fortunate enough to have the winning ticket um, for the, the lottery. I go in and I you know, basically show it to the, the lottery uh, folks in the office and I walk out with my first payment. Now this is assuming, of course, I don't take a lump sum. I take the annuity, um, you know, and again, over a period of time. But I walk out with cash on basically at point zero or day, day one here, okay? So slightly different valuation structure. One is I'm receiving the payment at the end of the time period. An annuity due means I'm receiving the, the payment at the beginning of the time period, okay? So of course, I can go through the valuation process. What's the future value of a three-year ordinary annuity of $100 invested at 10%? And notice here, I'm making payments, or payments are, are, are moving along consistent with the timeline. 
So that future value is $331 over a three-year period at 10%. Now, instead of going through the long, you know, heavy-handed math, I can actually go through and, and use future value to help me make these calculations. Here, of course, we have the 10% rate, the number of periods, and here's where, the, for the first time, we employ the payment function of $100, okay? Now, in this case, we're eliminating or not using present value and type, okay? So we close the parentheses, and we end up with the same $331.10. Now, if I move the other direction, what's the present value of that same annuity? Well, here, of course, we're discounting, um, as we've learned before, and the valuation is 248.69. And of course, we can use present value uh, in Excel to do, do those calculations for us in the same sort of methodology. So what's the future value and present value if the annuity were an annuity due? And notice that $100 that used to be out here, now we've shifted everything to the left and we have that valuation stream basically starting at 0, 1, and 2, okay? So what changes? Well, of course, we can do this long-handed, but <clears throat> what we can do instead of, and this is, you know, again, to show how this can actually be linked together, we have the, the, uh, the future value calculation, okay? Where we have the number of periods, or excuse me, the A4 is our rate, that's the 10%. A2 is the number of periods, and A3 is our payment, okay? Entered, notice it's as a negative. The only thing that changes is there's no future value here, so we skip over it, and we enter a one um, that's actually telling us, that, or telling the formula that these cash flows are occurring at the beginning of the period, okay? So, <clears throat> with this in mind, um, this gives us a valuation of the same $364 that we had before, okay? Um, that, uh, you know, essentially is, uh, you know, the same sort of calculation, okay? Present value of that same annuity due, um, again, we can do it long-handed, um, or we can actually go through the same present value calculation, okay? And come to the same exact result, the 273 55. Okay, now another factor that we're going to talk about um, or another issue we're going to talk about is how we make decisions based on use of the present value. And as we're kind of thinking forward a little bit to the capital budgeting sequence um, that we're going to be encountering a, a couple weeks from now, um, present value rule basically helps us to understand, um, at least from a quantitative standpoint, when we should pursue a project versus when we should not. Okay, So in general, this concept of the net present value is the quantitative assessment of basically the, the, the present value of any future benefits, or present and future benefits, less the present um, value of any um, present and future costs, okay? So when we conduct a net present value, all that really means is it's just the summation of all the present value um, valuations across the entire time frame, whether that's three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever the case may be, all project cash flows reduced to a present value or today today's basis or bringing it all back to zero. So <clears throat> when we do this, um, essentially again this allows us to evaluate an investment decision and help us to understand if there's going to be some economic benefit to pursuing that investment, pursuing that project, or whatever you know the, the situation might dictate. Okay. Now because we're talking about um, the operational environment. All we're doing, and please realize that when we're going through a net present value um, calculation, we're doing so in order to basically um, come to an optimal organizational outcome, okay? All we're doing, all we're finding with the net present value is the economic or the quantifiable um, decision, okay, or the quantifiable outcome for that project. 
we may in some cases still decide to do the project even if it comes out negative okay we see a lot of this application in healthcare for example where it might preserve our not-for-profit status um, as a charitable enterprise and thus we help it helps us to avoid having to pay taxes um, it might be a organizational or community goodwill um, you name it there's a hundred different reasons why we still might pursue a non-viable economic project um, where we essentially decide that we're going to take the loss for whatever reason okay but in general we would want to accept um, those projects that have a positive net present value and reject those that don't so and there might kind of bring up the same issue with the question if it's a loser project today but creates goodwill in the community or preserves a not-for-profit status might be a reason to uh, to change our line of thought there okay this also allows us to choose among alternatives okay so if I have three or four different vendors that offer the same product or deliver the same service um, as we start to kind of map everything out in terms of how much their particular product costs the different maintenance um, situations how much staff training is going to be required whatever the case may be this valuation process helps to um, basically separate the wheat from the chaff we start talking about you know, potential returns or potential beneficial outcomes for any particular project or investment okay and then it net present value if we reduce all of those future cash flows to present value terms helps us to um, basically compare apples to apples at least again from a quantifiable basis so you know here and this is you know you know obviously simplified for the purposes of display here but uh, we have an uneven cash flow stream okay again we leverage that uh, timeline that we've already talked about we set up the the timeline to be able to um, capture or better understand when the cash flow is going to occur so and realize that a lot of work has already been done to even get us to this point because this is um, basically the the difference between all the benefits and all the costs within this year and we're coming up you know fortunately in this case to a positive 100 out here in time period four it's clear that expenses um, exceed benefits or exceed revenues and here we have a negative value okay but everything is discounted to present value terms to come up with this five hundred thirty dollars and nine cents okay now that 530 could be thousands it could be millions it could be billions okay but here we understand um, basically the the summation of all of those present values across this four-year time frame and what it means to us today at a 10 percent discount rate okay now notice there's no value here for time period zero okay if we have a value here it is not discounted okay because it's already at time period zero Okay, all the future values out here, the one, the two, the three, the four, are all discounted as we see here at 10%. If I have a value here, it goes into the calculation um, at the time period zero um, value. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so how do I do this in Excel? Fortunately, um, you know, Excel does a lot of the heavy lifting. So instead of present value, I use the Excel formula net present value or equal NPV I put in my rate of 10 percent I throw in all of my values okay and I can either either enter them manually like I have done here or you can go into and just simply when you're in Excel as soon as you drop that comma there you can come over to your series of cash flows and drag across so these would co go in as cell references which is what I actually recommend versus direct entry close my parentheses hit enter and I come up with the same valuation as we did over here with the, the direct calculation okay <clears throat> now the net present value will give us a dollar valuation okay um, what a lot of folks like to do though is be able to compare things on a percentage basis what percent return are we getting and the term we hear a lot in terms of the percent return is return on investment ROI okay now even though it's used a lot um, just if you haven't heard it before um, you'll hear it maybe from me first um, return on investment is a uh, 
it is a suboptimal way to evaluate uh, return on any particular project or any particular investment. The real issue is, is because return on investment, if you think about how it's calculated, that's my total return minus my initial capital outlay over my capital outlay, okay? Does not take into factor or does not take into account um, basically the time value money, okay? So we want to be able to use a term that basically it uses or leverages time value money concepts to get us a much more accurate um, assessment of what any particular project or investment will return. So here we've got, uh, I'm going to use an example from a, a um, basically an MRI investment project or magnetic resonance imaging system fairly ubiquitous across uh, most hospitals and we have a series of cash flows and uh, here all my dollars are in thousands or in K's so this initial capital outlay for this particular um, MRI all things considered is a million five and then I have positive cash flows for the duration of the of the analysis okay and again these numbers come from these are the final net cash flows NCFs net cash flows from all revenues less all expenses to net us out to 310, 400, 500, and so on. Of course, my dollar value for the initial capital outlay here, that million five, comes from vendor quote, any site preparation required, anything that I have to do in order to get this system up and operational. Okay, so of course, I can go through the valuation process longhand. Okay, now notice and you'll hear folks that have not been through um, financial analysis when they put together um, a project that they uh, that they're you know developing um, will consider all of these cash flows from time period one out through four at their face value. Okay, and it's not necessarily you know I mean it's understandable how that might occur. Okay, but once you had a course in finance, you understand that this we're sitting here today. You know, in this case, it's. Uh, it's May 26, 2017, so that's today. Or let's say I'm gonna start this project at the beginning of June. Well, this valuation today is much, it's different. This dollar today is worth much different than and much more than a dollar value out here in year four. So while I might use all these at face value, I can it can seriously exaggerate the returns that I'm actually going to get from this particular project. Okay, so be cautious for those uh, of those folks that develop some sort of financial analysis and don't apply time value money, time value money concepts um, simply because, and I'll show you here in a second what that really means. So 460,000 is the expected simple dollar return. To answer my own question there, is this a good measure? I would say uh, it is not. Okay, because if we actually do an appropriate discount, okay, based on, and we're going to talk about how we get this discount rate um, in a in a future section. We start looking at the weighted average cost of capital, and then we risk adjust that weighted average cost of capital for this organization based on the risk factors for this particular project. Eight percent is our discount rate, and we notice notice the huge difference this makes. We start talking about all these face value cash flow streams. That 750 is not 750 anymore. It actually comes to be 551,000. Okay. Likewise, 500 is 397. So when we add all these up, in in again this time period zero figure here, this million five is not discounted because it's at present value terms already. We can see that 78,000 okay is much different than our original 460. And again, to answer my own question, a much better, much more accurate measure. Okay, we never want to um, basically overpromise in, in anything, and we want to ultimately be um, conservative in every estimate that we put in front of any sort of decision-making body, whether that's your C-suite executives, whether that's your 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 board, uh, whomever. So I'd much rather be going to the board with a figure like this and these series of cash flows and fully explain how I arrived at them than to show up with this $460,000 figure over here um, and over promise and under deliver when actually it's, it's put, into, uh, put into operation. Okay, now how do we do this in Excel? Well, that same calculation we arrived at over here, the 78, we have our series of cash flows lined up from A3 to A7, okay? And we have our discount rate of 8%. 
So I just simply down here in cell A10, I do an equal NPV. I open my parentheses. My A2 is up here, that's 8%, 8, uh, 8 comma, and notice I've just dragged A4 to A7. Close my parentheses, and then I add in A3. And of course, we add this in because this is already at present value terms. Now note, if you actually did A3 to A7, Excel will still give you an answer. Okay, It is going to be inherently wrong, Okay, but it will do the calculation for you. It has, it has no idea what you're, you know, the logic behind what you're doing. It simply does the calculations for you. So you have to know how to use the tool. And in this case, A3, we add that back in. And again, um, hit enter and we end up with that 78,000. Okay. Now, the value to being able to do this, to link cells together as we've done in this particular calculation, now we can actually um, help the organizational decision makers understand the implications of um, if I have a change in any of my input factors. So let's say my discount rate, I go into my board and I say I'm using an 8% discount rate somebody on the board disagrees with it and says, oh, that's too high or that's too low, okay? I can adjust this one cell and everything else auto-adjusts. As soon as I hit enter, it will give me a new calculation, okay? Likewise, if I have a, a change in any of my cash flows, oh, I underestimated my return in, in, um, in year two. Let's say that becomes $600 or 600,000, okay? I make that one change, this auto-adjusts. Okay, so this becomes incredibly important when we start doing any sort of sensitivity analysis, any sort of risk adjustment uh, for the calculations that we're making. Okay, now <clears throat> that discount rate, okay, um, that we just talked about, the top of that timeline, in this case up here we're using this 8% discount rate, okay. There's various different theoretical you know, reasons, and you read through the textbook and you know, in this week and in future weeks how we arrive at that. And we hear a term is basically the opportunity cost rate for the next best alternative or alternative investment of similar risk. In all practical measures, and this is really why we're focusing or what we're focusing on in this class, that discount rate is simply our weighted average cost of capital, okay? Or basically, and we're going to talk about this later in the course, but weighted average cost of capital across all sources of, of capital for the organization um, and then we risk adjust that weighted average cost of capital based on the specific um, situation or for this particular project or this particular investment okay and again don't get wrapped around the axle too much um, at this point on the concept because we're going to talk about it a lot more um, down the road okay that rate does not necessarily depend on the source of the investment funds um, for each project, although we will talk about a slight nuance to this uh, when we get into the, the realm of lease financing. Okay, so <clears throat> what we that weighted average cost of capital or risk adjusted weighted average cost of capital um, becomes somewhat important, okay, because basically what we need to be able to understand is what our capital costs us and from both debt and equity sources um, because what we want to be able to do is determine as we find a percentage return which I started talking about a little bit earlier how do they compare if I can earn a better return than what my capital costs me of course that means that the the project is likely economically viable and of course the, re the negative or the reverse of that uh, is true as well so Again, to revisit a positive net present value, expected to create value for the, for the investor. A negative um, net present value means that it's expected to lose value, at least from a quantitative standpoint. Now, if I want to find the percentage return, okay, all I have to do, and really what this is from a very fundamental standpoint, is we can actually play around with that discount rate, okay? until we get this entire valuation process to come out to a net present value of zero, okay? So <clears throat> we can do this manually, of course. We can play around with the different numbers and come up with the exact out to whatever digit we need um, discount rate that makes this happen. 
And of course, um, we can also use um, Excel to help us do that heavy lifting. Okay, And here we use what's called the internal rate of return, or equal IRR. Again, A3 um, to A7 is my series of cash flows. And in most of your later um, versions of Excel, you probably do not even need to add this. You'll find as you open up this formula, it'll ask you for a guess. Okay. Um, if you actually go through the math behind this, this is actually, it, it crosses the x-axis um, a couple different places and you're helping the formula to, to give the one that, that's most likely um, closest and closest to zero. Um, but generally you can just do equal IRR, open your parentheses, um, basically drag and drop you know, this whole series of cash flows. Notice we use A3 at this point. Um, because this is part of our analysis, we want to know what kind of return we're getting off of this million five investment. So we close that parentheses and hit enter and we end up with 10%. Okay? So the decision point at this point is, well because 10% internal rate of return is greater than my 8% weighted average cost of capital, the project is expected to earn or create economic value for the organization. Okay, And that internal rate of return, again, is just the percentage return expected on that particular investment or that particular project over the life of the project that we've evaluated. Okay, Now, I also want to tell you, internal rate of return and net present value should both indicate whether a project will produce a positive result or not. Okay, They will both point in the same direction. Okay? It may not always seem that way. For example, you can have a negative net present value and the IRR will still be positive, but that IRR generally in that situation, the IRR will be less than your weighted average cost of capital. So you could have a negative net present value, let's say, of minus 250. The IRR might still be positive, but it will be below 8% just to pull numbers out of the air there. Okay, So don't get confused. IRR and NPV will always point in the same direction, of course, so long as you've done your calculations correctly. Now, as we get towards the end of this, we have to understand too that there is the possibility for intra-year compounding. Um, up to this point, we basically looked at each time period. It doesn't have to necessarily be years, but um, each time period as a single lump sum. But realize that uh, sometimes we have compounding that occurs intra-year or intra-period, okay? and we have to handle that um, appropriately. And of course, you can see the implications here. The future value of an investment is often larger. Present value of an investment is often smaller, uh, depending on which way we're taking the analysis. Okay, So if we were to convert something from an annual basis to a semi-annual basis, all we have to do is take our future value at three years, okay, at 10%. Our normal calculations here, that three becomes a six because we actually have six periods now going across this timeline. So in order to adjust that future value to six periods, of course we've got six up here for our n if we're doing our manual calculation. But notice as well, instead of a 10% value across that entire year, let's say, now it's 5% um, entry year. So 5% in the first six months, 5% in the second six months, so on and so forth as we hop along the timeline. Okay, So that 10 in our calculations is cut in half. Okay, And notice we have a slightly larger valuation Okay, because we're compounding more often. Okay, so if this turned into a quarterly, okay, um, that three years now, you know, we'd end up with um, basically, you know, three times four is twelve, right? Um, so we'd end up with twelve time periods, okay, because this would be four, okay, this would be four, this would be four, okay, and we'd have to divide that ten in fourths, so this would be um, basically point zero two five. And then, of course, this would be 12. Okay, So all we have to do to make these calculations is to just adjust our inputs appropriately so we end up with the, the appropriate valuation. Okay, Last thing, and maybe um, from this particular section, maybe one of the more valuable tools that, uh, again, something that should be taught in high school is this concept 
of amortization. Okay, amortization is what helps us to understand uh, what it costs to, to buy that new car, what it costs for a house payment, uh, whatever the case may be. Okay, and it's truly a life skill. Once you learn how to do it, it's incredibly simple um, to set up, incredibly valuable to understand. Well, if I make that extra $50 payment um, on my house note, how much um, sooner do I end up you know, paying off my house? Uh, what do I save in terms of overall interest? Um, and likewise, understanding you know, as you go into uh, negotiate on a new car, not just taking the finance you know, individual's word for it, exactly what your payment should be, um, actually knowing what it should be. Um, I will tell you in, from personal experience, um, in basically my 20 years of military service, there was at least two times, um, you know, once I learned finance, two times where that finance individual in the car dealership uh, was dishonest and was feeding me a number that uh, was not, um, or basically was inaccurate, okay? And I will tell you it becomes an incredibly valuable negotiating point when you actually call them on it um, and, you know, the best tool you have in any sort of negotiation process is um, your ability to get up and walk out. Um, so, but it's all predicated on knowing exactly what the valuation should be based on the input factors that have been provided. So how do we do this? Well, so I want to construct an amortization schedule for a $1,000, 10% loan um, over three equal payments. So this is what it would look like. First and foremost, we find out what our payment is, okay? So here we're talking about an annual payment, okay? So that annual rate is 10%, three periods, present value of 1,000. We don't use future value in type, closing parentheses, we end up with a payment of $402.11. So of course, if you're doing this for a monthly payment, okay, we would take that 10%, of course, divided by 12. Number of periods is multiplied by 12, okay, so 36 payments over three years. Present value, $1,000, stays the same. That's basically the, the loan amount. Close the parentheses, we'd end up with, of course, a different number here, but that's how you would actually convert it to a monthly payment. But in this case, we're staying with our annual $402.11. So what I've got to be able to find then, the second step to this, is finding the interest for that year one, which of course is quite simple. $1,000 at 10% is 100 bucks. So that first year's payment is $402.11. That's the payment I just found, minus my interest of 100. So my $302.11 is what's actually going to go towards the principal in that first year. Okay, And at the end of the first year, I have $1,000 minus my principal payment. I have an ending balance of $697.89. So of course, I can just repeat those same steps for years two and three, and I can come up with an amortization table, which I've got here and just I've rounded some of the numbers off so don't get confused that three or that 697 for example is just rounded up to 698 for presentation purposes but we can see after I do that first year that 698 then comes down here in this beginning balance uh, for my second year payment stays the same okay that's the same amount that's going to your lending institution um, your bank or whoever you've borrowed from okay my, this, of course, would be $69.80, which, of course, is rounded up here to 70. Um, I'm able to then pay a little bit more towards principal, so that you'll see that balance or that amount goes up during the life of the loan. But after I take 698, okay, minus my principal payment, 332, I end up with $366, which, of course, then becomes my beginning balance in year three, and I repeat the process until we get to zero. So at the end, that payment for a $1,000 note over three years at 10%, I end up making 1206 in total payments, $206 in interest to repay that $1,000 principal. Okay? And again, you can do this uh, for a car payment over, let's say, 48 months, uh, 60 months, whatever the case may be. You can do it over a 360-month mortgage. Okay, and if you need help in, in doing that, it's just instead of one, two, three, you're ended up you know basically one through uh, 360 months. Okay, and we just have to appropriately adjust the table um, so that we can understand exactly which way the rabbits are running in each particular month. Okay, 
easy to do. Once it's set up again, now we can start to do some of the calculations of you know, additional contributions, um, whatever the case may be. Okay, so I'll leave you with, uh, you know, with this particular saying. I think it's been attributed to several different folks, so I, I can't say it's solely Thomas Friedman or solely John F. Kennedy. Um, but one of the key things and one of the key takeaways I want you to understand from, from this particular section and perhaps the course as well is a vision without resources is a hallucination. You'll find a lot of individuals that will come up with great ideas, a lot of individuals that want to get something funded, um, but our job here and why we start to employ time value money concepts is we got to understand uh, from decision making standpoint within the organization um, what is actually going to bring economic value and economic benefit um, to the organization. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, thanks for your attention. Um, welcome to the course, and I look forward to uh, talking with all of you um, in the uh, weeks to come. Thanks so much.